Hey, what's up? And welcome to part one of a new mini series that I'm putting together that's designed to help you get a better understanding of exactly what containers are. I'm going to be taking a deeper look into the basics, and I'm also going to be taking a look at the myriad of tools that are now available as part of the container ecosystem. We'll be looking at tools like Docker, Podman, Scopio, Builder. We'll be looking at the Open Container Initiative, uh, container runtimes and container engines. We'll also look at some Linux kernel features like C groups and namespaces. Now, if some of these things don't mean anything to you right now, don't stress. You can watch the videos and they soon will. Throughout this series, I've tried to focus on actually using the technology rather than just talking and drawing about it. Because if you're anything like me, I find that seeing the technology in use actually helps me kind of piece together all the moving parts a lot easier in my head. So I'm starting the mini series with this video on the topic of why you should even care about containers to begin with. So of course, if you're already sold on the idea of containers, there's probably no need to stick around for this video. You can move forward to the next video on containers compared to VMs, or you can also move forward another video to when we're going to start building container images using Docker and Builder, where we'll also take a deeper look into union file systems and OCI compliant image formats. Okay, so first up, let's take a look at some examples as to why you should care about containers. In no particular order, I have four of what I believe to be the primary technical reasons here on the screen. I'll go through each and show a quick example of each as well. So first of all, on the list, we have containers house self-contained environments. What this means is that you no longer have to deal with prepping application environments with their dependencies manually, because all those dependencies can now be bundled in with the app. You can also worry a whole lot less about any potential conflicting software you have running on a host because the software in the container won't impact any other software outside of the container. So having everything bundled in a nice, neat, isolated package also makes it super easy to distribute, deploy, and run apps pretty much anywhere. So let's start with an example. I'll include this repo in the description if you're interested in playing around with it yourself. Now, let me start by saying you can ignore the apps themselves. They aren't anything earth shattering, but they do help me prove my point. So you can see on the left of the screen that we have a node 6 directory, and that houses a node 6 application. And then we have a node 14 directory, and that houses a newer node.js application that runs on node 14. For the node 6 app on the screen, I just did a real quick search for an API that no longer ships with Node.js. And that's the os.tempter with a capital D that you can see there on line three. And this will fail on any version of Node newer than the final release of version six. I've also got the Node version 14 app here. And that was another quick search for an API that was released more recently on a newer version of Node. Um, and I picked the generate key pair synchronous API so this will fail on older versions of Node. So in particular, in this case, it will fail on Node 6. Now for the demo, I'll be using Node Version Manager or NVM for short to quickly change between different versions of Node running on my Mac. So you can see that the current version of Node running on my Mac is Node 14. So of course, if I was to run the Node 6 app, we're gonna run into some issues. And there you can see that the os.tempter is not a function. So that function no longer exists in node 14. It's in node 14, it's now a, a lowercase d. So obviously to fix that, we can change the node version from 14 to six. We can run the app again, and you can see that we now get our temp directory printed out and the node application works. So that's all good, except for the fact that I also wanna run this Node 14 application on the same machine. So if I try and run that now, we'll see what happens. And there we go. As expected, the generate key pair sync function is not found in Node 6. So we do need a newer version of Node for this. I can quickly change over to Node 14 and just rerun the application. and we can see that the application does run under node 14. So you can see the issue here is that we have two apps with different and conflicting underlying dependencies. So to get this running consistently on many different hosts can obviously be a real headache, but containers make this problem super easy to solve. Now I've already containerized both of these apps, bundling in their required versions of node with them, uh, and we can have a quick look at that now. So first of all, we can see that if we run the container uh, for, of the Node 6 app, we're getting that to work, even though currently my Mac has the Node version 14 set. And of course we can run the Node 14 app as well. And we can see that both applications are running just fine. 
And again, that's because we've been able to bundle the Node.js version that's required by the application in with the application itself and run it in a container, which is in its own isolated environment. We'll look more into how to build these container images in the next video, but for now we'll go back to the slides and move on with the dot points. Next up we have containers make very efficient use of infrastructure. So you've just seen how quickly those node apps spun up their own environment, executed their code, and then shut themselves down to no longer consume host resources. So it's safe to say that containers are fast, cheap, and they only use system resources when they're running. Let's take a look at another example with a demo web app on how quickly these containers can be started. You can see here that we've got nothing currently running on localhost port 3000. So let's start up a demo container that I've created called Hello World. Now, if you don't understand what everything here means on the command line, don't worry, we'll look into all that in more detail in the coming videos. But for now, if we hit enter, we're gonna start the container. We can come back to Chrome, refresh, and we can see that almost instantly we have a Hello World web application running. Now, what if we needed another one of these web applications running? That's also not an issue. We can come back, we can run the exact same command. We'll change just the port number so that the host is now listening on a different port. Just so that we know that it's a different application, we can pass in an environment, vari environment variable called background color. And in this case, I'll give it the color orange. We'll hit enter, and then again, we have another container spun up. So if we have a look at port 3001, we can see that we now have the same app spun up, but with an orange background. If we no longer need them, we can come back to our command line and we can kill them off. You only have to reference enough of the container IDs so that it's unique, so that the CLI can identify the containers that you, that you need to stop. If we come back to Chrome, we'll see that those processes are now dead. Now, containers aren't only fast and cheap, they also have a very low operating overhead. Let's take a quick look at this. I'll spin up the orange container again. We can come back and see that it's working. And now let's have a look at the container stats. Now here you can see how little system resources this particular container is using. So granted, there's not a lot happening in the container. It's a very lightweight web application. But you can see that it's, it idles at 0% CPU and it only has 19 megabytes of memory used. So obviously I can come into the web app and reload it a few times and we'll see the CPU jump a little bit. But the idea here is that a container environment is running. It's only using 20 megabytes of memory. If you were to put this single application into its own VM, for example, you'd be using significantly more system resources. Now, it doesn't really say it here, but containers are also very efficient on disk space too. And the reason for that is because they use a union file system. I cover this in a lot more detail in the building container images video, but for now we can move on. Next on the list, we have predictable immutable environments. Now the keyword here is immutable. It doesn't mean that you literally cannot make any changes to a running container, but it does mean that you can't make any permanent changes to a container. This immutability prevents a wide range of potential bugs and other issues caused by accidental changes or ad hoc fixes to assets as they move between different environments. The idea is that the container promoted from dev all the way through to production is exactly the same every step along the way. Let's take a look at this. Now we still have our container running from the last example so we can reuse that. We can see that's still up and running. So what I'm gonna do here is make a change to this web application. I'll put like version two after hello world. So what I need to do first is get a shell into the container. And I'll make a quick change to the app. Now, if we give the web app a refresh, we can see we now have hello world version 2.0. Let's now get out of the container, kill it off, and restart the exact same container image again. We can check, we can see that the status of that container is now exited. If we want, we can clean that up as well. So we have nothing left, and now we can run the exact same container image again. So now we have another container running using the same container image on the same port, and if I give this a refresh, we can see straight away that our version two change has been reverted. So we're back to our known good state. The previous changes 
no longer exist. So there's still some flexibility in there to allow you to tinker and troubleshoot your containers, but just keep in mind that any permanent changes that you require will have to be built into the container. And that's not an issue either, that's pretty easy to do, and we'll look at doing that when we get to the building a container video. And the last point, containers are very portable. So due to the relatively small size of containers, for example, some can be as small as five meg, and container standards such as OCI that I'll cover in more detail in the build video, containers can be distributed and run with ease on any system that uses both a similar kernel to the base image in the container image, and also an OCI compliant container engine like Docker or Podman, for example. Container registries are the secret to the simplicity of container distribution. So let's see how easy it is to deploy or move a container image from one host to another using a container registry. So what I'll do is use the Docker CLI to push the Hello World demo app that we've been looking at to the IBM Cloud container registry. Now in this example, I'm using IBM Cloud's container registry, but this could be any registry like Docker Hub or the Red Hat container registry as well. So the first step, let's log into our registry. Okay, that's good. Now that we're logged in, let's take a look at the image that we want to push up to the registry. So we can push that top image there with the version one tag. All right, that's done. Let's take a quick look at the IBM Cloud Container Registry. So if I give this a refresh, we can now see that we have one repo and we have one image in that repo. So if we check this, the images out, we can see that we have the Hello World version one image in the repo. Now I won't go any further into container registries right now because I've got a whole video in the series on that. So if you want to learn more about that, you can flick over to that video as soon as you're ready. But what we do want to do now is go to a different host, log into this container registry, pull the same image down and then run the image. So if I come back to my command line, I've got a different host here. I've just got a host called Docker. And again, I can log into the container registry. And now it's as easy as simply just running the image. We can make it no different to what we've been doing in the past. This time I can give it a color of teal so that it's easy for us to see that it is a different container image running. And there we go, the container's running. Let's go to our web browser, open a new tab. And there we go. That's how simple it was to move a container image from one host to another and get it up and running. Now, whilst these reasons are compelling, these really are the most basic advantages that containers provide pretty much out of the box. Understanding containers is really just the beginning of a journey to all the amazing advantages that container orchestration technologies like Kubernetes and OpenShift bring to the table. There's probably too many reasons to move to these technologies that I can cover in any one video. And really they're outside of the scope of this video series anyway, but I do plan to cover them more in future videos. Hopefully I've shown you enough about the benefits of containers to at least take some time to learn more about them and watch the rest of the video series where I'll dive much deeper into the technology and find out in detail how everything works. So please join me in the next video where I'll give a real quick rundown of the main differences between containers and VMs before moving into building container images with Docker and Builder in the following video.